Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Danny Lichtenfeld, director of the Brattleboro Museum. I'm so pleased to be with, here with you this evening and really excited about this event. In just a moment, thanks to the magic of Zoom, we're going to be transported to photographer Rachel Portese's home studio in Saxton's River, Vermont, where Rachel is going to demonstrate for us how she makes her tintype photographs. As you may know, the museum is currently exhibiting an amazing series of tintypes that Rachel has made. They're called hair portraits, and they feature images of female models with their hair in these extraordinary gravity-defying sculptural arrangements. The exhibit was curated by Mara Williams, and it will be on view at the Brattleboro Museum through February 14th. If you can't see the exhibit in person, or even if you have, um, you can also take a virtual tour on our website. So go to brattleboromuseum.org and under exhibits, you should be able to find that without any trouble. I really encourage you to see this work. It's so original and powerful and well executed and it's been resonating far and wide. There have been glowing reviews of this ex exhibit uh, and articles in, in major publications throughout the United States and abroad. So tonight, um, after Rachel's going to do a demonstration, and then after she's done, she has kindly agreed to stick around to answer any questions you might have. So um, please uh, feel free to participate in that Q&A. And um, as always, if you'd like to do that and you're here via Zoom, uh, there should be a Q&A button somewhere on your screen. Please use that to type in your questions rather than the chat box. It's just hard to keep track of what goes into the chat box. It's, it's much easier with the Q&A button. Um, the chat's really there if you need to convey some sort of message to me or to our events manager, Jessica Nelson, who's behind the scenes, like if you're having a technical issue or something like that. Um, the other way to participate in the Q&A is to wait until it's underway, and then you can use the raise hand button, um, and we'll get a cue to unmute you, and then you can ask your question yourself rather than typing it in. Uh, I think that's all the housekeeping I, I need to do. And so without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Rachel Portese. Hi, Danny. Um, can you guys hear me? We can. Oh, good. Okay. Um, well, um, thank you for having me this evening. Thank you to the Brattleboro Museum uh, for the uh, solo exhibition. Um, I'm thrilled to be part of uh, your programming. And thank you to Jessica for, for arranging um, this evening, the tintype demonstration. Um, I'm just gonna start tonight. I'm here with my studio assistant and model Isabel, um, and I'm zooming via an iPad. She's gonna hold it and follow me around and I need to um, show you around my studio and I'll make a tintype. Isabel, here we go. There we go, okay. Um, so I'm just gonna start first by talking a little bit about why I started making tintypes to begin with. Um, I'm a huge fan of instant photography and I always loved as a kid shooting Polaroids on the old SX 70s and all kinds of cameras. Um, in the 90s, I fell in love with um, Polaroid land cameras and shooting um, 667 film, et cetera. And um, I shot them for many, many years until Polaroid stopped making film and then Fujifilm made film. And then eventually it was out of production. But um, I, I, after having kids and not working for a while on my creative process, I started to um, get back into photography. And my first instinct was to go for Polaroid. But um, as I said, the film was out of production. And um, I did a little research and I found this other type of instant photography, which is uh, wet plate collodion photography. And it, even though it's one of the earlier forms of photography, it is instant. Um, each piece is original. It's made on a light sensitive plate and it develops right there. 
And I really like that aspect of it. Like I'm not Photoshopping later or doing things that I do like for work. There are pictures that I made for myself. Um, if, so thus began the journey of trying to make tintype photographs. Um, I spent a long time not getting any images. There wasn't, it was like around um, 2013, there wasn't a lot of information around online or to be found on how to make tintype photography. I bought a tintype kit and um, I just kept getting black plates. But eventually I found the Penumbra Foundation in New York City and I took a tintype making class there. And for anyone who's interested in photography, alternate process photography or any kind, I recommend that you take a look at their website and become members. Um, they offer great classes, lecture series, and even during COVID, um, their programming is just incredible. So um, I took a class there and, um, and they showed me how to make them. Um, and at first I do wanna just say for people who are, have some familiarity with tintype photography, you imagine these old large wooden cameras, this cumbersome equipment, but um, I spent the first year or so making tintype photographs with equipment I just had in my house. So first I was using a Holga, um, it's just a plastic camera that normally shoots a two and a quarter negative. But in this case, I was making, um, I cut tin, or not tin, it's a, a, aluminum, um, to, um, to two and a quarter size and put it in the camera. So these, I mean, this one I didn't pull the plastic coating off, you'll see. I do that later. So these are just photographs I made out in the street in New York during my first class. Those are what I found. Um, the exposures are really long for a camera like this or um, when I also retrofitted my Polaroid camera to shoot 10 times as well. So I like hold the button down for 30 seconds um, and my subject had to stay really still. And at the end of the day, my finger would have this dark imprint of from holding a button down for that long. But so I'm just saying this to encourage people um, to use the materials you have on hand to make photographs. You don't always have to have a lot of fancy equipment to try something new. Um, so after a year of shooting like that, um, I bought my first real kind of tintyping camera with a tintype lens. And we'll take a look at it right now. It's a four by five camera called a speed graphic. Um, that Ouija used in the 30s for his street photographs. Um, and so it has a nice big lens, it lets in more light. So the exposure time is a lot less. And, um, and as well, this creates less depth of field, which I think you, some of you have seen tintype photographs is a really narrow part of the image that's in focus. So um, I shot with this for a while and with a portable dark room that I made from a suitcase, which I'm gonna show you in a minute as well. Um, after shooting with that for a while, I wanted to revisit a square. One of my first cameras that I loved a lot, my dad bought for me for my high school graduation. It's a Yashica Matte G. And I really love shooting square. Um, and when I started making these large square images, I had the uh, record albums in mind, like that nice square, you sit with a record album, look at it, read the lyrics. Um, and I started shooting the squares on this big camera. So. Um, as you saw with those little cameras, a tintype, because it's an, a um, direct positive on a metal plate, it can only be as big as your camera on the back. Like you could make a 35 millimeter tintype uh, from a 35 millimeter camera. But in this case, I have a really big camera with its 14 by 14 square. You guys can take a look at it. I mean, all cameras are just a box with a lens on it. So um, it's simple. It's how it's been since the beginning. A photography. This is my big beastie. Um, tonight we're gonna just make a still life so you can see for yourselves how the process works. Nervous. Okay, there it goes. Um, so we'll be shooting the still life tonight. This is the portable dark room I was telling you about earlier. This is my grandfather's old suitcase. Um, and that's why it's on a tripod. It's a portable dark room. Um, and I can show you later during the question and answer if you want, it's a little tricky to set up, but if anyone really wants to see it, I have photos or I can set it up. This top opens and a little metal frame goes to hold it up and all this dark cloth kind of comes out. And so my chemistry can be in there light sensitive. I put a red headlamp on and um, it's big enough to hold um, the plates for the four by five. Um, so we're gonna photograph this tonight. 
And, but for now, let's come on in the dark room and I'll talk a little bit more about how they're made and show you the plates. Um, so tintyping chemistry is poisonous. It's a little dangerous. That's why I'm wearing this, this apron. And you can see all the black in my studio. This is from silver nitrate. Um, the silver's in this tank here. And it's what makes um, negatives and, and, and all of this um, light sensitive. So I wear goggles and an apron um, as well as gloves because I get it on my skin as well. Um, we're gonna be shooting a 14 by 14 plate this evening. And um, this metal is aluminum. As I said earlier, um, they're called tintypes. And I did a little research to find out why they're called tintypes. They were made on iron plates before and now aluminum um, that's painted black on one side. Um, I, the best guess was that tin snips were used to cut the side. So anyway, tin, tin types, tin snips. Um, these plates are painted black on one side. I get them from um, this place called the Main Trophy Company. If you have kids or if you've ever won a soccer trophy, it has that little black plaque at the bottom that says, you know, first place or whatever. It's this, it's black on one side and then they engrave on it showing the silver through. But for our purposes, um, this is the black and, and the photographs are gonna make. So I'll pull the plastic off and talk a little bit about that. Um, the first chemical that I'm gonna pour in the plate is called collodion. And I think of it <clears throat> as a glue that the silver nitrate sticks to. And the silver is what makes the plate sensitive. Um, I'm gonna show you this little tintype here to explain. Can you see that, Isabel? So when I open up my camera lens and the light hits the camera, the lighter parts are where the silver is gonna stick. So that's the silver. And in the darker areas, it's where the silver uh, rinses off. And the blacks in this plate are literally just the, the blacks from that are underneath where the silver rinsed off. So if you've seen an amber type, they're made on glass. And so the blacks wash off and you can see right through the glass. They're put on a black fabric to show the blacks. And so this is how they're done with the tin type. So um, I'm gonna put that there. I'm trying to think what else. I think right now I'll just pour the collodion on and walk you through the steps. I'm gonna um, the next step is light sensitive. So after I pour the collodion and put it in the silver nitrate, um, I need to turn off the light. So I'm just gonna close my darkroom curtain. Okay. All right, let's hope I get this right. So you pour a big pool of collodion and you wanna get it moved around the plate quickly. If it builds up, you get kind of too much collodion in a foggy plate. So I'm gonna do my best to do this quickly. And then the excess goes back in the bottle. There's some form of this collodion that's used in medical bandages um, as well. Okay. I'm gonna get the excess pull off the plate. Okay, so once it's in the silver, it's light sensitive. It stays in the silver tank for three minutes, at least. Sometimes I leave it in there longer. I've never noticed a problem with that. So I'm gonna set the timer for three minutes. Um, and then we'll go just double check the focus on the camera and make sure our shot is as we like it. Um, after I expose the plate, um, we're going to come back in here and develop it and then put it in the fixer and that's where the where the image appears. Um, I forgot to say one thing about that plate, which you'll see in a minute. Um, after I take it out of the silver, I'm going to put it in this plate holder, which will hook up to my camera. Um, and then when I pull the slide out, 
the exposed light sensitive part of the plate will be facing the lens and that's how the light gets in there. So let's go take a look at the camera now and make sure our shots in focus. So focusing a camera works like any camera you have. It's the distance of the lens from the plane. This is the ground glass. And when I put the, the plate in that plate holder, the plate will be in the exact same place as the ground glass. It has to be. Um, we spoke before about the narrow depth of field. Um, if it shifts a little or anything, the, where what part of your image that's in focus changes drastically. So I'm gonna take the lens cap off and put this on. And this little knob here moves the lens further or closer to the, the subject or object. Um, Isabel, why don't you come on in here with the iPad and go under the dark cloth and take a look. Is that good? Can you see mm -hmm. in there? Um, if you guys can see this or see me, um, you'll notice that the image, the still life that you're looking at now is upside down. So these dolls are underneath and the suitcase is on top as well as if you're looking at it out of the camera, he's on the left. But when we make the image, he's gonna be on the right-hand side. It's gonna be a mirror image. If there was a word here, it would be spelled backwards um, in the tintype. One other point of interest is um, these lights. Tintypes only take a certain kind of light. It's a, a certain spectrum of light. It's really blue. Um, these are close to daylight. I think um, it's a very blue light that registers and um, I think it's 5,400 Kelvin in the, in the light spectrum scale. Um, and it takes quite a bit. These lights are really warm. I have tons of it on here. Um, it takes a long time for the light to travel from this lens all the way back to the plate. And again, it's just that blue spectrum, which is tricky and why you can't just use a light meter to check you know, um, how long an exposure should be on a tintype because it's a really outside if it's a cloudy day or a blue sky, how sensitive the plate <clears throat> is really shifts drastically. So um, this is in focus. Rachel, this is Danny. Yes? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you hear no me? Problem. Yes, I can hear would you. you mind just show, would you mind just showing us again the upside down image? A couple, yeah. Somebody typed into the chat that they weren't really able to see that. Okay, here, let me tuck, Thank you. tuck the, um, the dark cloth under here a little bit. And if you can't see it now through the camera, for some reason, when I make the tin type, it'll be evident. So, is that Danny? You'll have to let me know if you guys can see that now. Yeah, I I can. I hope okay. I hope everyone so these, can. I can definitely see it. So this could be me upside down. Yeah, thank Hi, you. Everyone. Okay. <laughs> um, so I check the focus. I'm gonna put the lens cap on. And. Let's go get the plate out of the silver and shoot the plate. Well, I'll let you go first so I can close the curtain behind us. Okay. I'm going to put on gloves. As I said, silver nitrate stains everything. I often wind up with black marks on my hands. They stay a long time. I guess it's a chemical burn. It doesn't feel like a burn. It just makes, it feels a little tingly and it can leave little black spots on you. I have one on my nose right now, you probably can't see. But um, I feel like every time I'm going to a fancy occasion, I always have black marks on me. Makes me feel way less fancy. Okay. So this has been three minutes. Get the plate holder ready. Have these towels for wiping the excess silver off. Um, one thing that I really like about this process, even though the chemicals are very poisonous, they I just keep reusing them. So this silver bath that I'm using right now is the same silver I started in 2013. Um, when it loses its power and it stops working strongly, um, I can leave it in the sun and that rejuvenates the silver. I can add more silver nitrate powder or, and then to make it weaker, I can add water to it. So it just keeps going. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to shake all the excess off. Yeah. It's like a sourdough starter, I guess. Keep adding to it. 
Um, and because it stains everything, I like to get all of the excess off my plate before putting it into my camera. And as I showed you before, um, how the image is upside down and backwards, I like to put my pore line at the bottom of the image. And in order to do that, I'm gonna put it at the top of my plate holder because the image will be upside down. So I'm inserting this. And this is the back. It has these little springy things on it that will hold the plate in the exact same position that the, um, the ground glass is, the focusing screen. Once I load this in my camera, as I showed you before, I'm gonna pull this slide out. And you can see now that the silver nitrate and the collodion will be facing the lens to make the picture. Okay, let's go do it. Okay, I'm making sure the lens cap is on. I'll take the glass off. Pull the slide out. In this exposure, I'm going to try 26 seconds. That's what I did my test plate at, and it looked really nice. Um, I used to count 1 1,000, 2 1,000, 3 1,000 um, when counting and timing my, my, um, my exposures before. But if I was like really amped up or I had a loud song playing or a slow song, my counting was erratic and so were the results. So now I just use the timer on my cell phone. Okay. Um, and if you want to get an idea how long my models have to stay still, um, try to stay perfectly still for the 26 seconds from the time the lens cap comes off until the time it goes on. Okay, on the count of three. One, two, three. Okay, that was it guys. How'd you do? <laughs> it's a long time to stay still. It's even a long time to stand there. Okay. So now I'm gonna put the slide back in, which will protect the, um, the plate from the light. Isabel, I'm going to have you go through first. Yeah, I can close the curtain. Um, so for me, this next step is the trickiest bit of making a tintype. It's the development process. And for those of you who are photographers and you've developed negatives and prints, there's a certain amount of time you develop them for. You just set the timer for 30 seconds and off, off you go. With a tintype, um, I'm gonna quickly pour developer on it and try and get it everywhere evenly as quickly as possible. But um, the development time um, will be determined by what I see emerging from the plate I kind of look for like a little bit of skin tone to come out if it's a person, or in this case, I'm gonna be looking at a, some of the detail in the suitcase. Um, the development time changes um, with temperature, with age of the chemicals, like my collodion's a little bit older now, the developer's fresh, um, and it's a decent temperature in here, but it, it varies. So there's no time where it's all by eyesight. And anyways, I hope I get it just right for you guys, because when I'm nervous or, on display, that's when I'm more likely to mess up. Okay, I'm gonna take it out now. Um, and then after the developer, 
Um, you'll see it's a little foggy. Oh, a couple other things about the developer. In order to stop it, I'm gonna pour water on it. And um, I don't have running water in here, so I just use jugs of water. They work just fine. So the water will first hit the developer and slow it down um, almost to a stop. And then I'm gonna turn on the lights. We'll put it in the fixer. And that's where, if I've done everything correctly, the image will lift out of, out of the fog. So, okay guys, here we go. I'm just gonna set this plate here. Well, dry stuff. Okay. Okay, I can see a little of the dolls, the suitcases there. Detail to emerge in the suitcase. I'm starting to see the texture of the um, the weave of the fabric that covers it. There we go. Okay. Okay. There's like a little bit of a waxy coating that um, I pour until that's gone away. I don't know if you guys can see it or not, but no. Yeah, thanks. And now here comes the light spot. There's a lot of reflection, so but this is my favorite bit. I'm gonna bring it over here in the light so you guys can see it. Here it goes. It looks like it's gonna be okay. See this little fog starts to lift. So this is the best part. And this is what's a lot like a Polaroid for me. It just feels magical. And really because the process is so crazy, I really never know if it's gonna work out right. I'm glad it did for you guys because I'd be mortified. But every time I hold my breath a little like, did it work? And um, it's even more exciting when I'm working with an image um, that I'm really happy to be making. So. Um, this is a little bit of that collodion, remember, that I talked to you about that I wanted to be at the bottom, and there it is. So I oriented the plate correctly. And then it'll stay in the fixer until, until this rubs away, if you want. Some people leave it there. It's like a little signature, a nod to the process. But um, so I don't have running water in my dark room, so I bring this into my laundry room and run it under water. Um, and why don't we go do that? Uh, okay, let's go rinse this baby. Rachel, it's Danny again. I'm not sure if you're talking now, but I don't think we're no. hearing you. Like, I don't, oh, okay. Can you okay. hear me now? Yeah, no, I, maybe yeah, I should yeah. be saying yeah. something. I'm sorry. I got a little Oh, no, 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 it's okay. I, I, just, I just didn't know. It's, water. No, it's totally mesmerizing. I just wasn't sure if you were speaking and I maybe I'm- I thought you were something. there. Okay, so. <laughs> That's okay, that's okay. Um, so here we go. So I'll just show you what happens next. Um, so this is rinsed. Um, so typically, um, that what happens now is these plates, um, usually I have to tweak something. So, um, I have to take several shots to get one that's just right, but I want to actually, actually use the dryer plate. I shot a plate earlier today that's already dry. So this would go on this plate on this, uh, drying rack here and I'll go through the next step. Um, so this is what it looks like when it dries. So they dry a little bit lighter. And then after they dry overnight, 
I will varnish them, but I want you guys to take a look and see that this baby here had, um, had a blue little baby thing on and now it's white. And then these are varying degrees of red, which turn a little bit darker. Um, let, let's go put this next to the thing so you can see how it's flipped over. And then I'll talk about varnish. <laughs> So here's the plate. Can you see that, Isabella? Or is it too yeah. reflective? Yeah. I can tilt it a little bit differently. So you can see this guy is now over here, etc. So that's the plate. Um, let's go look at the varnish. I'm not going to varnish this because it involves a hair dryer, and I think that'll be just too much for you guys. But I'm going to tell you about the varnish because I think it's really exciting um, how it's made and how it looks. So varnish is made from gum sandrac. It's all natural. It comes from a tree. Um, it's, it's kind of like a smaller cypress tree, the sandrac tree. And this is a little bit like pine pitch. The trees are in Morocco, mostly where they come from. But there are other areas, I guess Australia as well. So these little beads are what it's made out of. It's all natural. I soak them in grain alcohol. Um, I'm actually making varnish now, so I'll show that to you. Um, it actually, it smells nice too. I love that it's all natural. Um, so I put it in a jar with grain alcohol and just shake it until it dissolves. And you can see that it has now, otherwise there'd be like little chunks of beads that look like um, candy or something. Uh, I just shake it till it's dissolved. And you can see there are little tree bits in there. I'm not sure if you can see that. It's all natural. So what I will do next with this varnish is filter it about six times through coffee filters back and forth. And you have to filter it a lot. If you get lazy about filtering the varnish, if you see any of my 10 types that have little, like little dust and flakes get in them. So, um, and I add lavender oil to it as, as well. This can be used to varnish furniture or anything. I'll take out a plate right here that has been varnished so you can see the difference between a varnished plate. It's a much like the wet plate. So the varnish, how I showed you the plate gets a little bit lighter when it dries, the varnish makes it dark again. But um, I love the unvarnished plates, how they look, how the silver is kind of flat. Um, so after they're varnished, they sit for, they dry for at least three days. It depends on the heat and humidity. It takes a while for them to be able to be wrapped and not tacky anymore. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. That's really the process. Um, I'm going to head back in my studio and um, Danny, we can start the question and answer, I guess. Isabel, did I forget anything that I should say? Okay. Um, I'm just gonna put these paper towels here so, so it doesn't sit on my thing. All right, come on back in the studio. And I'll take this and flip it back around. Thanks, Isabel. Um, flip and... Uh, thanks, Tanny. Can you hear me? Yeah, totally. Okay. All right, good. Uh, perfect. No, uh, no, thank you. That it's totally fascinating. So cool. I have no idea about any of that. I'm sure many of the people who are tuned in know much more about it than I do. But um, that was just totally fascinating. And you did a great job explaining it all as you went. So thank you. Oh, and thank, thank you, you, Isabel. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to invite everyone who's out there, if you have any questions or comments for Rachel, um, you know, let's, let's do that now. You can type them into the Q&A and they're starting to come in here. Or as I mentioned earlier, I think you have a raise hand button somewhere. You can do that if you want me to unmute you and then um, you can ask Rachel your question yourself. Um, Rachel, I have a couple of things I want to ask just to, um, to get started. When you were showing us how you pour the collodion on the plate, um, does the plate have edges or are you just like really skilled at not having it spill off everywhere? There, there are no edges. It, it kind of wants to stay on. Kind of, um, people are always kind nervous of about it. doing it, but I'm like, spill yeah. it, do whatever you want, just try it and you get a feel for it. I sometimes dump it yeah. everywhere actually earlier today. I just, something happened, it spilled everywhere. Just wipe it up. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
And um, like, should we be worried about you with the poison? Like what aspect, what's poisonous in there? And what, um, so, like, how do you, how do you deal with that? I worry about it myself. I have a, an exhaust fan that I wasn't running because it sounds like a helicopter is ready to land. And I didn't think that would be uh -huh. great for the Zoom call. Um, but I, I try to not stay in there with it. The, I have a, a, a mm -hmm. fire safe chemical cabinet that I keep things in. So when I'm in here and not making it, it, it keeps yeah. the fumes down. And I just try not to breathe them in as much as possible. But so it's like few, the the dangerous fumes that you're that you're yeah. breathing in. Yeah, like and then you, when I'm making so do you the sometimes chemicals, use a mask. Um, I don't. No, I don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I think people do mm -hmm. wear a mask. I don't wear a mask. Um, Except when I go how, to the grocery store now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how how often um, do the images turn out how you imagine they would and want them to? And like, how often are they, are you totally surprised or disappointed or pleasantly surprised? Yeah, it runs the gamut. I feel like sometimes I can work for a whole week and not get anything I'm into. But if I'm really rolling with it, if I get one or two images uh, for a full day's work, then I'm, 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 then I'm yeah. happy. Like if I really get one image after a day of working, I'm happy. Wow. But they don't just uh -huh. really get cranked out. I mean, that plate, I didn't get specific, but. I needed to change the lighting. I mean, there's a lot of tweaking to be done before it would be something that I would be happy with. Yeah. Tweaking that you can do or like, oh, that one didn't work out. Now I have to go back and start over, like take a whole new image. Yeah, no, I have to take a whole new image each time to tweak uh -huh. something. So uh -huh. I probably would like in that image, the um, the puppets were a little blown out. So I would like I would change the lighting a little bit or often the developing and contrast isn't quite right and I have to mess with that. But since I made one earlier today, um, the first one was a disaster. It was all foggy and I started to panic because I'm like, I'm gonna do this demonstration and there won't be anything. But then I thought that's a perfect demonstration of how it goes. <laughs> um, but I did get a good plate and so I had confidence that the next one would be closer. So, it, on, on my screen here, it looked really good. I, I don't, um... Yeah, I don't. I mean, I can't tell with you know details and things, but it seemed like it was generally successful. The one you, Thank you did. Thank you. I was happy with it. Yeah. Oh, good. Um, and so some people have uh, written in questions and comments here, so I'm just gonna I'll just start in with those. Okay. Um, Peter asks, well, how what do you apply the varnish with a brush, or how do you do that? Oh, Isabel reminded me before to to say that, and I forgot. Um, I pour it on just like the collodion. So I have a little pouring, oh. but I don't pour it from that jar you saw. That was me making it. But I have a little jar with a nice pouring spout and I pour it on and roll it on and drip it off just like the collodion. And then I take a hair dryer and, and with heat and dry dry the back for a while. It just heats. I think it adheres the, the uh, varnish to the plate a little bit better. Thank you. Are there... Are there commercial, there must be commercial varnishes that you could use rather than making your own from those beads and then having to strain it all those times to get the debris I out? I think so. There's another formula I know of, um, but it has some poisonous chemicals in it. And I just, I like uh -huh. the way this smells and how it's, I just haven't experimented with other varnishes because this yeah. one makes me happy. <laughs> yeah, nice. <laughs> um, Let's see, Mary says, that was fascinating. Thank you so much. Did you coat the black side? Also, how do you dispose of the chemicals when they're finally done? So um, the black side, I buy the plates that way. Um, they're coated black on one side. I think some people coat their own. People can go really old school with this process, obviously. Um, I buy them coated black. And um, the chemistry, I just keep using it. I mean, there's really just a little bit of developer each time the rest of it I, I keep using it and then fixer I, I bring to a local school to to dispose of with their fixer but there's very little chemical waste which is another part of this that I really appreciate cool a couple people are asking about whether you can reuse a plate um, I guess there is a way to clean off the plates and reuse them but it's incredibly labor intensive and I have yet to uh, to do that myself mm -hmm. Um, MJ says, so interesting, thank you. Uh, Peter asks, what is the developer? 
Um, the developer is um, made from, let's see if I can remember now, is that a nefarious sulfate, um, grain alcohol, and a kind of another, an acid. I make it myself, but I think you can use, um, a, there's a, I think you can use a regular Dectol developer as well. I'm not positive. I just learned how to make my own and I do. Cool. Um, boy, we're getting a bunch of technical questions here, so oh which is great. Um, I, you, maybe, maybe, every, maybe everyone here is a photographer <laughs> or, or, or about to be. Um, is the fixer acetic acid? Um, acetic acid is used in the developer. That's the acid I was trying to remember. The fixer I use is Ilford Fixer. It's just mixed um, one to three instead of, I think, when you're developing prints. It's been a while now. I think that's one to nine. So it's, it's um, I uh, use, you can make your own fixer, but I think it, it has cyanide in it. Something that when I was making these, um, I was like, huh, I think I'll keep that one out of my house for now with my little kids. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. Do you, uh, Tanya asks, do you use any color filters to change your image rendering? I do not. Can you even explain? I'm not, I don't understand that question. What would that, how would that I'm, work? What does that I'm mean? Not, I'm not sure. Uh-huh. Okay. I don't, I don't really know. Tanya, does if you Tanya... feel like chiming in and explaining more, <laughs> I'd, I'd be curious, but it's not something that you do, Rachel, in your process in any case. Um, well, so Pat is asking, I'm glad she did, can we see your suitcase dark room? Can what? Can we see your suitcase, your portable dark room in oh, your suitcase? Oh, yeah. Yes. I'm going to turn this around. This could be, cum it could be a little cumbersome and crazy, but I'm going to turn, I'll put this somewhere over here and you guys might want to start, actually I'll give it to Isabel and you guys might want to ask other questions while I'm doing that so that it's not... I'm going to set up the little portable dark room. So if you want to flip that around. Um, so I have a question about the um, 26 seconds where if I were a model, um, I think I would have done pretty well, except I was blinking a lot. Oh, um, well, like, so, so blinking, does that mess up? Yeah. Blinking yeah. is okay. In fact, it's the, the exposure is so long that I can take, I don't have any L right now, I should have thought of that. I can take a self-portrait by taking the lens cap off and then just standing still through the exposure and then putting the lens cap back on. And there's no record of me um, moving really? at all. And yeah, in fact, Deb um, had a band at her house once and we were trying to get this shot of the band staying really still and Deb walking in this long dress behind them like a ghostly figure. And it was really hard to get her to walk slow enough to show up in that way. So um, you have time. Yeah. Huh, so, it, so it's not even like you see a ghostly image or something, you just, it just, un, unless you're there for a while, it doesn't even appear at all. Yeah, yeah, so it's very huh. cool. I mean, with this setup and these lights, if I were outside, the exposure would be a lot less. It was my four oh, by I five see. and here, I can be between nine and 15 seconds, but outside sometimes, like I was shooting a lighthouse um, in P-Town and my, it was like one or two seconds. There was so much light oh. out there. So yeah, uh -huh. so in that case, a blur would show really rather quickly. Right. So, so here it is. This is just dark cloth that I glued on here with like Gorilla Glue or something. I actually don't need the other stand. I have a little stand that goes in here and actually it's just a, an old uh, TV tray stand. That my friend Melissa snagged for me. I was like, I need something about this big. And she saw one in a free pile like the very next day. So, and it happens to just fit in here perfectly and hold this up. So um, this is it. So when I'm making um, tintypes on the go, I, um, I keep the silver tank in here and then I bring the play holder in with my red headlamp and, and have at it. So that's it. I don't think my grandfather ever imagined his suitcase would be used this way. <laughs> anyway, so that's the um, that's the portable dark room. So um, thank you for showing that. That's really cool. Uh, back in the day, like when you had these tr photographers traveling around with their setup, would they have a portable dark room like that, like something um, like that that they would use? I gotta turn this around. Sorry, I'm confused by the. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. 
they would have a, a they have to have a, some kind of portable dark room and they they and they can sell them um in all different shapes and sizes um also um a, a photographer that i know and admire um she just uses a huge cardboard box i mean because oh. these are so um the plates are incredibly light sensitive i think even the light coming in the sides you can have, it, it's all good. So she tapes this um, black fabric in this cardboard box and just keeps reusing it. You can put one in the trunk of your car. Uh -huh. whatever. So anything goes. From the, from the time you expose the plate, um, how long can you go before you develop it? Like, does it, will it, you know, so, will it deteriorate or can these like be stashed away for years and then you take them out and develop them? No, there is a process shooting on dry plate that you can stash them and, and, and um, expose them later. But um, these are called wet plate and you're supposed to shoot them while the plate is wet. I've left them sitting wet. for a while where I've had some technical difficulty or something and then I've used it and I've never had a problem. And I, I heard a story uh -huh. of this photographer who had to like prep his plates on an island and then get in a helicopter and go somewhere and shoot it and that worked fine too. So. I've never pushed the bounds of that. I don't, I don't know. Uh -huh. um, so when we hear stories now and then of like these, these plates were discovered, you know, 50 years later and then developed, those are dry plates, not wet plates. Oh, I think probably. they probably are talking about negatives of some kind. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah, they probably found some glass negatives or something and then developed uh -huh. them and made prints. Okay. And, but I don't think they, I don't think that it was a plate like this. Okay. Okay. Oh, you can wait a while after um, exposing it before you develop it though. I, I don't know how long in that either. Yeah, yeah. I see. Okay. Uh, MJ was asking about your lights. What kind of lights do you use? Um, these are called, um, one of them's called York stand lights. They're actually really hard to find right now. They're fluorescent lights with five, 1400 Kelvin temperature and I've got like 12 in this and another 16 or something in the other two lights and it's still not enough like I it, it, it's like I, I could have tons more lights and be really happy it would get my exposure time down that's what that's the effect it would have it would bring down the exposure time yeah from 26 seconds to something else yeah so interesting. It's like such so such a finicky environmentally sensitive process at like every step of the way. Yeah. When something goes wrong, it takes a long time. It takes a lot of experience to get to where you can figure out what the hell is like the, causing it to be wrong. I mean, we spend a lot I of time bet. here, Isabel and I, problem solving crazy stuff. Yeah. I bet. And so when you get in, when you get some new equipment or new lights or whatever, a new space where you're going to set up, like all of it, you have to kind of recalibrate all those variables. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Really cool. Um, Peter asked, where did you shoot the exhibit photos? Um, I shot them right here in my studio with these lights and Isabel or my other model, Rachel, um, pinned up with their hair pinned up to this wall. I, just, I don't know if you guys can see it, but just right there, the same spot where the um, still life is set up. I have a stool there that they sit on and, and where I style them. <laughs> and so each one of those, they sat more or less still for 26 seconds. Yes. Yeah, some yeah. longer when I had older chemistry and sometimes shorter. If it's really light out actually in my studio light filled, it, that changes the exposure time as well. Well, I want to, oh, um, <laughs> Juan asks, who is this Isabel you keep referring to? <laughs> Hi, Juan. <laughs> so maybe, what, maybe we can, <laughs> should we turn Juan, the camera Juan's on? Juan's wondering, who is, who is this Isabel? <laughs> Isabel is right there. <laughs> <laughs> Isabel is Rachel's wonderful assistant and a model for some of the hair Aww. portraits and, and was following Rachel around with the camera here in, um, during the demonstration. One might know Isabel. Oh, oh really? Okay. Yeah. Um, P Peter says, amazing. Thank you. I want to second that and um, just put out a, a last call here. If anyone has any other questions for Rachel, or comments. 
Um, this has been so cool, such a treat to get this like, you know, little visit into your studio here. I don't know, my is it snowing Zoom. up by you? Is it the Zoom studio? It's my visit? first Zoom tintype demonstration, but it, 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 was, it was okay. All you, you mystery was, people out there. <laughs> it, was, it was great. You did a great job. Um, thank you so much. And I was just thinking as I was watching the snow come down this afternoon, like if we were endeavoring to do this in person, uh, you know, like a January evening event in Vermont. And um, yeah. so this way we have like, you know, 30 plus people who got to do this, uh, see this demo. Love it. Um, oh, someone's asking, can we, can we have a quick look at the cameras on the wall? And then, oh, yeah. uh, and then someone has raised their hand too. So we'll, we'll call on them in, in a minute. Okay. Here they are. I've had many of these for a long time. And a lot of them I've, I've used, um, the Super 8, the film cameras, uh, the moving film cameras. And this one was my grandmother's. And then I'll just do a little. Oh, wow. Some of these, uh, I've you used ever... many of these, like that image right there was taken on. Yeah that camera right there. Oh, cool. I have all kinds of ways but for you, making funky old cameras work. But you don't use those anymore, the ones that are displayed on the wall? I do. Or sometimes um, you do. They're made to take off, especially, well, uh, the Polaroids. I've had this wall of cameras since I was in my 20s. Um, these are, I can take them off and use them. They're all attached. So I've used, I still use the moving cameras the Holga and um, and I have a little bit of Polaroid film still, so I can take them off and use them still, yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Mary says, you're so talented, thank you. Oh, thank you. And um, so Rachel, someone named Gina Portese has raised her hand. And so we're gonna unmute Gina. Gina who... mm. <laughs> <laughs> Same last name, um, I'm curious. Jessica, I think we need you to unmute Gina. I don't think I'm able to do it. Can you hear go. me? Gina? We can hear you. I want to take, I want Isabel to hear too. Nice, nice job. Nice job, ladies. Isabel, you did a great job. Rachel, we're so proud of you. And <laughs> it's amazing. I never knew what really you were doing in that dark room. See? I'm not just getting away from the family. <laughs> we love you. It's great. Nice and calm, seeing that your yeah. chemistry wasn't working this morning. Well, yeah, I know, right? You guys got the other end of that. When I was like, yeah, exactly. Seriously. Was, was thanks so for, thanks for telling them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Amazing, Rachel, really. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Uh, many people are saying thank you here. And then somebody has um, informed us via the Q&A that dinner is ready and waiting whenever you're ready. Nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, and that's the last question in the, in the Q&A box. So that's, for, that's probably going to be a, a good place for us to wrap up. Uh, Rachel, Isabel, thank you again. And, and Rachel, not only for this tonight, but for giving the museum the opportunity to share your amazing work with the world. It's been such an honor for us and so exciting seeing the reception that it's been getting. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. It's such an honor to have the exhibition at the museum. And I, I want to thank Jessica Nelson, our events manager, too, for all the behind the scenes stuff that's necessary to make an event like this happen. Thank you, Jessica. And um, before we sign off, I just want to let everyone know that a recording of tonight's event will be available on our website, brattleboromuseum.org, within the next day or two. Um, there's also a recording there of the fantastic artist talk that Rachel gave a couple months ago, so you might be interested in checking that out as well. Um, we have a lot, we have many more events planned in the weeks ahead, and if you'd like to make sure that you know what we're up to and maybe uh, there are others that would interest you, then on our website you can sign up for our email newsletter. Uh, also, if you follow us on social media on Instagram or Facebook, 
that's a good way to um, keep informed about what we have going on. And last thing I would like to say is that if you enjoyed this event tonight and feel inclined to make a donation to support this type of free programming, we would of course be very grateful for that. And a donation of any amount is really meaningful to us. And it's all, also okay if that's not something you're interested in doing or able to do. But if you are, you can do that too at our website, brattleboromuseum.org. Um, I think that's it. Stay safe and take good care of yourselves and each other and look forward to seeing you again soon. Good night. Thank you, Danny.